Hi, um, thank you so much to Culture Hub and everyone who is tuning in. I hope that there are people there. <laughs> um, you know, I also just wanted to acknowledge that this whole weekend has been like a grand experiment. So thank you, Culture Hub, for being so open and responsive to the moment that we're in um, and allowing us to participate in this um, this. Uh, experiment and we'll see how it goes. We intend to do um, some discussion and also um, some audience engagement. So again, if you're participating, we would love to hear from you via the chat functions. Um, my name is Simone Salvo. I'm from the Magnum Foundation, a nonprofit expanding creativity and diversity in documentary photography. Um, and my other hat is that is as a graduate student at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU. And I want to speak as little as possible today because you both have such fascinating um, stories and projects and work. Um, so I'm gonna, I would love for you both to introduce yourselves. And when you do, I would, I'm also gonna give you some um, different name tag options with different personality traits that I would love for you to choose from. Uh, you have your own yes, mic. I've got my own mic. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ann Bennett and I'm a producer on the Raising Liberty Square project, uh, which is a feature documentary uh, looking at the lives of um, Miamians um, in the, uh, one of the first black, uh, segregated public housing projects in the South, um, in Raising, uh, Liberty Square in Miami, Florida, which was now going to be raised to the ground, hence the title Raising Liberty Square. And so we are following the stories of the people who live in this neighborhood present and past. And I'm working with my collaborator, Katya Essan, who is the director and actually the woman who came up with the concept for the documentary and the project. And, and I don't know if we can switch to Katya now so she can introduce herself. Is Katya available? Oh, oh hold on, oh, hold, hold on just a minute, Katya. Hold on, so we're just working on the audio. Um, but so we're working on a feature documentary. Um, we started uh, two and a half years ago, and we found that we had all these amazing stories um, from the people who live in Liberty Square. Um, and our contemporary story is really looking at climate gentrification, but we found all of these historical stories in um, oral histories that Katya has been gathering for almost three years now. And we wanted to find a place where we can, where we can share those stories as well. And so Katya will tell you a little bit more about that once we, uh, once we get our audio resolved. So, um, uh, but until then, why don't maybe um, Robert can get started and then we can tell a little bit more about the project. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Hi, right. my name is Robert Pluma. I'm a multimedia documentarian, a visual artist, and a creative technologist. And I'm going to be talking today about a project that for now I'm calling Hidden Histories of San Antonio. It is a project that started as a very personal project about my family's history, connection to the missions of San Antonio, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And my family has been there for many, many generations. Our what are referred to as the Coahuiltecan people, um, and I'll get into that a little bit later about why that's not actually a true name for who we are, and, uh, but also a name that we're reclaiming to this day. And uh, I'll be talking uh, with Simone about this. Simone's from Magnum Foundation, and I could not possibly be here without their support, and I'm very appreciative of them and the Henry Luce Foundation for making this possible. I just got back from San Antonio yesterday. I still have mud on my boots from the San Antonio River, so I'm really excited to share all the things that I've been finding in this most recent trip. Um, well, this might be a good time as we're, as we're still seeing if Katya can join us to, I just wanted to acknowledge that you're both in process and like, thank you so much for, for sharing that because I know that, um, sometimes that can be a very vulnerable place to put yourself in to, you know, start to share work while it's in the process of being produced. Um, so I did want to ask you both because we do have a live audience. Oh, Katya's here. Great. Hold that thought. Yeah, I think you can. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. yes. Yay. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi, Very happy to be joining in from Miami. Yes, my name is Katja Esson, and I am the director, as Anne wonderfully explained, of a long-term observational documentary called Raising Liberty Square, and we're now um, developing a companion piece, a VR a virtual reality project that's called uh, Liberty City VR. 
Um, and ca yeah, Katja, can you tell a little bit why, um, what prompted you to do, um, you're doing a feature documentary, why do a um, virtual reality piece? Because during the nearly three years that we have been filming um, in this community and with this community, we collected a, a treasure trove of uh, oral history stories from especially elders, community elders. Um, and we were trying to find the perfect platform to show the world their memories. Because when they were children, the neighborhood that is uh, nowadays considered one of the most uh, dangerous and, and abandoned neighborhoods in the entire country, but when, when they were children, it was a vibrant, beautiful, cultural, uh, African-American neighborhood. And um, very few people, I mean, they remember it, obviously, you know, and, but, but there's no general knowledge of that time and the importance of that neighborhood and all the things that came out of that neighborhood culturally, politically, uh, musically even. Um, so we are, you know, that's, that's what we're focusing on. That's what we're focusing on, putting their memories into a, uh, you know, bringing their memories alive, you know, from the 40s, from the 50s, from the 60s down to the 80s. Great, great. Great. Thank you. So um, that's a great segue. I think before we, we show some content um, from your projects, I wanted to ask, because we do have a live audience participating and because you are in process with the projects, what for all of you um, would be useful for you to get out of today's conversation? And you know, is there is there something that you're looking to get out of today's conversation? And speaking on behalf of yourselves and also the communities that you're working with. Well, um, for our project, we are you know, telling a story, a neighborhood story. And for us, what is really most important is that our story is accurate, that we are accountable, and it really reflects the lives um, and the essence of the people in this community. And so for us, what we're really interested to, to get is, you know, what, what resonates with our story? Where do you find connections? And, you know, where do you start to, so we want to see what interests you to go into the story, to go deeper, to go from one chapter to another. So Katya told you a little bit about a couple of themes we want to hit within our virtual reality, but we're still, as work in progress, trying to figure out, well, how do we get from one theme, how do we get from the 30s to the 40s in an interactive environment? You know, how do we get from, you know, serious topics about, you know, segregation to entertainment? You know, how do we get from 60s civil rights to um, 80s um, uh, hip hop? So we're still trying to figure out, like, in an interactive space, what are the prompts, what are the triggers, what are the ways that we can encourage our participants to go from, from one space and explore another. So that's what we're trying to, to get, and that's what we're hoping to get this afternoon. That's great. Thank you. I'm really interested to explore the very notion of history itself, and I'd like to hear from the audience about how they've experienced history, who they think should be telling that history, how it's interpreted, and, and thinking about ways that all these different narratives can intersect to build what we perceive as sometimes an official history and how we can challenge that. How we can find new ways to tell our own stories and make sure that, that we feel like we're being represented in the histories that we're encountering. Thank you so much. Um, are we able to uh, show some of the snippets? Maybe we should start with Raising Liberty City. Uh, raising Liberty Square. Sure. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. um, so I might need some technical help just to see how to share screen. I don't know if they have it or not. You got it? Yeah. So they'll, I guess, roll tape? Is that awesome? Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Hold on. Action. Action. <laughs> uh, let's see. Always planted trees. All of this was trees. Actually, if, if we may start again, this is an important scene. There we go. Thank you. Right. 
right here. This is my house where I grew up, 1209 Northwest 64th Street. That was my bedroom window right there. There was a tree. Mom always planted trees. All of this was trees, and she always planted trees and flowers wherever she was. This is me in front of the mango tree. Cherries and mulberries and almonds and guavas. Avocados. Like paradise. <laughs> if you went uh, away, you went downtown, or you went on an errand, your house, you left your door unlocked. This was the kind of community that we had. Those were golden days, you know, golden days. Singing glory, hallelujah. And so this was like a haven, and it was a pleasure to live in the project. Liberty Square was... to live in the project. Liberty Square was family. As a child, we didn't know we were poor because we had such a rich life. The neighborhood hotel became the social center of the South. Muhammad Ali had his victory party in this very cafe where I'm sitting when he beat Sonny Liston. Dr. Martin Luther King stayed here Malcolm X, Jackie Robinson, Nancy Wilson stayed there. You know, that we could just go on with the names of, of celebrities who, when they performed on Miami Beach, could not live there. They had to come in the black community. When Liberty Square was um, initiated in October of 1936, the wall it was the message of breaking off of this neighborhood from the surrounding neighborhood, which was white on the other side. Segregated housing left black communities largely underserved. No political representation whatsoever. So you have, you know, oftentimes very poor electrical services, very poor um, water management, almost no green space to speak of, underrepresentation in terms of educational questions. Um, and that leads to, again, a sense of disempowerment. The riots that emerged here in the 1960s, again in the 80s, multiple times, that problem was set in motion as early as the late 1930s with Liberty Square being in place. The concentration of poverty is really what then contributes further to the problems that the neighborhood faces in terms of drug and you know, vice industries, in terms of you know, liquor stores, again, in terms of overall danger to you know, young people. A former Miami Northwestern senior high student shot and killed. Four people shot The area a has become crime, known for its poverty drug use. and gun violence. Miami's most dangerous neighborhoods. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping that Katya can join us on the line. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about um, starting a VR project alongside um, a film project. Is, is, is Katya here? <laughs> I guess that oh, there's there another go. video that started there. Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> Hi. Hi. I just I wanted to, to give you an opportunity to speak now that we've seen um, this clip from the, the film um, and speak to this idea of creating a VR piece um, alongside of it or uh, having a VR piece emerge from it. And also to acknowledge that um, most of the people at this table are coming from a, a non immersive reality background, you know, starting more from a traditional film background. And so that experience yes, of also coming would, to this um, medium. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I, I, it was uh, an incredible jump and also an incredible uh, uh, knowledge leap that I had to do because um, it, 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 it was, a, you know, it felt like a good idea to do this. So we applied to a, a very big local grant here in Miami and we actually got the grant. So then we all kicked in gear and 
realized, okay, now we really have to do it. Now we have to do this VR project. And this was in December and I spent the entire Christmas vacation with uh, Quest goggles on my head, looking at VR pieces. I'm trying to understand, you know, what was working, what wasn't working, you know, how, how the language is, how I even, you know, how would I even start t telling uh, uh, somebody what I was envisioning? And then I had to also real I realized very fast that as a documentary filmmaker, I was my, I was caught in my in my realm of documentary. I did not at all. I didn't have any idea, really, you know, how to use what is possible in VR to to tell this story. You know, I was much too much too linear, much too, uh, yeah, documentary-like. So I, you know, thank, thank God we, we started a collaboration right away, you know, with um, uh, many of the community members, many, many also of the young artists here in, in Liberty um, City. And when, when they started telling me, you know, of scenes that they were envisioning and colors and style, I realized, oh my God, oh my God, I have to throw everything that I know away and I have to think again, you know, how, how this can be told. We can, we can, there's so much more, you know, what, what we can do here. And what was also coming, you know, again, as a documentarian and having a very issue oriented film that we Anne and I are working on, you know, I, I am always thinking, you know, what's the social message? What's the, you know, what do we have to portray? I was thinking, you know, we have to show the segregation wall. We have to show climate gentrification. We have to, you know, the Miami riots or the Miami uprising was very important and very intricate, like, like explaining why the neighborhood declined so much. And then again, the community members themselves were like, no, nah, mm -mm, no. No, we don't. We won't. We will not go to the riots. No, that's not what we're interested in. What we want to show is we want the world to see how beautiful it was, how we grew up, that this was paradise for us, that you know we had all these cultural institutions here, that all this music came out of here. The younger the younger artists then said it was funny because we have you know 90 year olds and then we have 30 year olds and <laughs> the 30 year olds were saying okay great you know MLK was there and gave the first version of his I have a dream speech actually you know in Liberty City and um, Sammy Davis Jr. performed there and Muhammad Ali was there and they were saying okay that's all great but what about you know Miami bass and two life crew and all what that meant to hip hop you know um, and then it's interesting to see how the older generation is kind of like swallowing their whatever they want to say because of course you know for them um, the Miami bass and the and the, the the lyrics the tough language is is not really what they uh, uh, want to portray but they understand that this is a very important uh, time also and an, an important cultural uh, um, a thing that happened here that affected uh, you know music in the United States so it has been it has been fascinating and challenging and a lot of fun also and in that way I mean this, way, becomes this becomes a, uh, a, a project yeah. about preservation I mean there is such an urgency with this project um, because as you said this area is about to be raised and um, new developments about to go up um, and it brings me back to the theme of um, ReFest this year, of regeneration, because when I was thinking about this title, Raising Liberty Square, I was thinking raising, like the demolishing, and then raising as in raising up, um, and this like intergenerational um, storytelling that's happening. So I am just curious about the older folks you were mentioning, their nine-year-olds you know, that are a part of this venture. What, um, what was their reaction to VR? Well, I, I think I still have not quite been able to uh, uh, make it 100% clear because most of them have never had, a, you know, a goggle on their face. And I remember me, you know, like three months ago. So I've been reenacting it. I've been telling it. I've been trying to explain. And uh, yeah, they look at me, okay, we, you know, whatever, but the po important is what, so what are we telling? What are the stories that we're telling? Are we telling, are we, are we telling the world that we closed down the street for Christmas and we all skated, you know? 
So it, it doesn't matter that I, I, I you know, right now at this point, it, I don't think they care so much that I say, well, we will actually be in it. We will be skating with everybody. We will be there. We can turn around and see everything. And they're like, yeah, 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 great. But you have to also put in the candy lady and the whatever conch fritter lady. And you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's, uh, I think when we have, when we actually create it and people will see it i mean some of course some we have everything from like really 90 to as i said 30 and less than 30 and many people do know what vr is but some don't but they don't care it's it's um the stories that they you know want, don't want to be lost so they are everybody is so happy that we're telling this and of course now we're coming to the point we have to select because we will, it will be 10 to 15 minutes the experience, so we have to now choose what we're putting in. And uh, uh, this is also going to be a, a, a difficult process to kind of decide really on what are the, I mean, we, I think we have some of the events clear and some of the locations, but um, we have to decide with everybody what's, what are we going to show. Can, can you give us a sense, and we'll just ask one more question before we switch over and then we'll all discuss together. Um, but you know, Robert's using um, augmented reality. So this idea of like layering on top of um, your uh, normal kind of interaction with the space in the world and you're using virtual reality. So can you just talk a little bit about so that everyone who's watching can understand um, what, where is the experience? Is this something anyone at home could put on a headset and participate in, or is this really site specific? How do you imagine no, that it, working? Actually, we, sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but we were thinking, we were had also, we were thinking augmented reality at first too, because because of uh, the buildings that are gone now, and you would be there, and you could, you would be able to project something on that site where it's something something is not there but then we decided against that because liberty city is so vast that people will not be able to to travel you know all this the, these places so yeah it, it people um people will be able to experience this at home of course we we our goal is that they you know the the vr that the experience and the goggles will be housed at uh, important cultural institutions and places in Liberty City where people can go and watch it. Uh, one big goal is that this will travel with the documentary when the documentary hopefully will go to lots of festivals and lots of uh, conferences but then we can bring we can bring Liberty City with us and, and people can actually see what it used to be. Um, so that's, that's for now um, the idea and then we we have to look at educational use and again i'm, I'm still a, a vr baby so i, I know that i'm sure that there are many other um variants that we can do um so that more most more people can see it you know thank you so much i love that term vr baby <laughs> yeah. um so if it can you be a i was like <laughs> Virgin baby no let, let me be baby <laughs> Um, can we can we switch over to Robert's screen? Yes. And while we're doing that, do you have any questions, Simone? Or? Well, I'm curious actually which um, personality traits you both picked out of the mix. Oh, no, no, you go oh, ahead oh, first. Oh, okay. Um, where did I? Where am I? Oh, here I am. Um, so I have for my personality traits, I have um, nurturer. It's mm. good. Um, questioner. Um, and um, eh, uh, mess maker. Yeah. Oh, gotta be honest. <laughs> um, and uh, listener. Those are my key traits. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I took what was left and categorized them because normally I might say that I like to be a rule breaker or a problem solver, uh, which are great categories. But thinking about in terms of the work that I'm doing here with this project, um, I'm trying to take a step back a bit, and I think it's important to acknowledge that objectivity isn't really as, as uh, significant or necessary. I think it's good to put ourselves into our work and to really make our own perspective known. And that's something that a number of people have pushed me to do uh, as I've been doing more and more of this work. And, uh, but in this case, there are so many different perspectives and so many different instances of these stories going back hundreds of years. So I need to act as a an impartial researcher to a certain extent, and I certainly have my own perspectives that I'm developing, but I wanna make sure I don't lose others in that process because I'm trying to gather from so many different sources. So I picked dreamer and tinkerer, 
but also very importantly, peacemaker and space maker, because uh, that's really the roles that I'm starting to fill in, in talking to even contemporary, um, you know, gathering contemporary stories that are gonna present sometimes opposing perspectives, sometimes contradict each other. And I think it's really important to offer space for all that, and, and I've used the term in the past of imagined histories, and even going so far as even if you think that, that it's something totally made up, at least make the space for somebody to share that and others can make up their own minds about what they think is real. And uh, so, looks like we've got my screen up and I'll start sharing some content. And also, I have a bunch of ephemera here. I'm not sure if we'll get to it at some point, but we can get to that after we're done with the screen time. Now, we were just talking about this concept of being new to technology and I, I also love the term VR baby. But um, I think that um, it's important to always remember that the technology is secondary. Okay. That okay. I love the idea of creating a really magical novel experience for viewers, but the last thing I want to do is have the technology take over and replace the story. So thankfully, um, we don't need all the, the bells and whistles right now, and I can actually just show you some of the raw content that I've gathered in recent days. So I'll start with this, these mock-ups uh, that Ziv Schneider helped me make in a... Uh, after a Magnum Foundation project development lab, and I created these to present them at the Photography Expanded Symposium that happened in 2018. Now, this is just sort of a general idea of what users of this mobile application, which will be primarily based on augmented reality, will encounter. And it'll be bilingual. It'll provide a map of locations, but really the whole point is you just explore and experience this really incredible historical site without having to stare at your screen the whole time. And occasionally, maybe you'll get a buzz or even an audio prompt to uh, engage in some sort of action. So the image on the right, you'll see that sort of floral pattern. And when we uh, come back to um, the view of, of us later, I'll show you a tile here that's just sort of, oh, here we go. Hey. So this is so somewhat representative of an uh, object that people might find. And they'll be asked to scan this. Mm -hmm. And something might uh, appear above the tile. Right, that'll be a story element. And the whole point is that they'll encounter all these fragments one piece at a time. And I've got a friend here over my shoulder if he's able to get a close-up of that. And uh, this is actually an example of tiles that were made uh, quite some time ago at the missions. And Mission San Jose was known for making tiles like this. Mission San Jose is the one that my family is from. Now, my grandfather worked in the tile shop when it was recreated in the 1930s after the missions had been in ruins and there was an effort made to try to um, reinstate a certain sense of what life had been like previously. And so he would help as a child make those tiles that, that were created for a brief period there. And he was among the last generation to, lived at, to have lived at Mission San Jose. And that is one of the reasons why I was inspired to create this project. I realized that there were all these incredible stories that I was just beginning to learn about that I hadn't heard a lot of details about um, when I was a child, and I really wanted to pull out more of these stories from, from my elders and not just from my family. I'm, I'm starting to engage with people from other uh, families of mission descendants and also a lot of regional experts who have a lot of really great things to share. And so this next one gives you a sense of what people will encounter. They'll be guided around the missions and then later on also other historical sites around San Antonio to then uh, explore all sorts of different histories. So when they walk past this, for example, you'll see on the left there's what looks like a little foundation there that's been there since the early history of the mission. That used to be a workshop. So perhaps they'll hear the sounds of a workshop as they walk past there. And then they'll be encouraged to then engage with that story, but they don't have to uh, right in that moment. Here's a very rough mock-up of what it'll look like when people encounter these fragments. It's not gonna be a complete picture. It's just gonna be a tiny little slice, very much like the experience that I'm having, where I'm exploring and finding things that may or may not be connected between all these different narratives. So uh, at the top there, for example, on the upper left, you'll see a photograph of my great-grandmother. And below that, uh, on the left side of that set of three images is Mrs. Harris, who is a woman who actually had no connection to the missions and started to, um, started to reinstate their, their old way of life. And around that same time, the, um, the US government actually started getting involved in rebuilding the walls. It had completely been in ruins. The dome of the church had fallen in. My great-great-grandfather used it to store hay for his horses. And, uh, and there are all these really incredible elements that, that a lot of people visiting the missions today wouldn't even realize because it's been so thoroughly restored. 
a lot of visitors I've spoken to thought that those were the original walls, that the church had never fallen apart. And um, so as all of these fragments are gathered, they'll be able to then piece them together and they'll even be directed to find interconnected story elements and then we'll build this narrative out. Now, um, I don't have some of my older work here to show you at this time, but if uh, you just go to my website, robertpluma.com, that's R-O-B-E-R-T-P-L-U-M-A.com, there'll be a link for uh, an old presentation I did at the, um, at the symposium that Magna Foundation put on. And there you'll get to see, for example, a photograph of my grandfather making a gesture at a wall. And that's him talking about how he would climb the walls as a child. And then uh, subsequently, um, you know what? I actually have a video I can show you. I'll pull that up right now. But uh, he will tell the story within this application about how he would climb the walls as a child. And then that allows us to talk about the history I was just describing, about the walls and how they're not the original walls. And then we can talk about the actual original creation of the missions, why the missionaries showed up, what the experience was like for those who were living there, whether or not those, uh, my indigenous ancestors had a choice or what that choice looked like and, and how they became assimilated into the mission culture and challenging all these different histories that may have been told in ways that didn't complete the picture of everybody's experience. Uh, there, there are so many individuals involved in, in what we see as this broad monolithic history and I definitely want to start picking that apart. So here, uh, we actually have a triptych that I created, and hopefully we have the audio. Well, we don't, but it's not that important. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So uh, what you see there are three elements, uh, the one on the right being my grandfather initially pretending to and then actually climbing up the, the walls, the, the flying buttresses there that support a portion of the, the mission grounds. And that's how he would get up on top of the wall and he was showing me how he would do it. He was, I believe, 81 at the time. And what you don't get to hear, unfortunately, because it's a slow motion video, is my grandmother, Hortensia, out of the frame yelling at him, get down, get down. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that triptych actually connects to a lot of elements of the work that I'm doing in that, or, or trying to do, in that there are two other images on the left show some people from an indigenous people ceremony that was organized a couple years back in San Antonio. And something really interesting that I've encountered is that there are many different ways that contemporary indigenous cultures around San Antonio are, are choosing to represent themselves. And, and try to draw from the past because there are some cultures, so for example, in the center of that triptych, there was a, a Comanche person who was being smudged. And to a certain extent, some of the, the greater Plains cultures, for example, are, are what were really heavily represented by, by Curtis and all these other photographers, and even by popular culture. And it's great that to a certain extent, some of their ceremonial practices and ways of life and appearance were well preserved, but even when that was being documented by Curtis and many others in the latter portion of the 19th century and into the 20th century, that's not how they dressed on a daily basis, that's not exactly how they went about their lives. And my grandfather on the right is also an indigenous person, I'm also an indigenous person, and, uh, but we're from a culture that was largely eradicated in terms of our day-to-day -day practice because of our assimilation into the mission culture. And um, I actually want to read something that I've written in the past about this project that, that sums up a lot of, of this sense that I have and that I think others I've encountered seem to have as well. And it says, the identity I was searching for when I began to research my family history, a project initially meant only for myself and my family, may have been reduced to an intangible phantom, though I've come to realize that we have been unintentionally reclaiming and inventing it throughout our lives. Our imaginations conjure gods of varying origin and form. Sometimes these gods die, and sometimes they fuse into new deities. The symbols and ways of life we have adopted are unique and feel like home. Uh, uh, but
but also, interestingly, I, I shared that with somebody um, just a few days ago who challenged me on the notion of inventing. And I had to clarify that I didn't mean creating out of nothing, I meant innovating and trying to find these tiny little fragments of, of who we are, who we were, and trying to tease out different, um, different new versions of that, that way of life, of that culture. And one really, really incredible example I found was a recreation of songs. And there were songs used to evangelize the, the indigenous population around San Antonio. And they're, they're strangely beautiful and haunting. And there, uh, there was a book called the Al Haba that uh, that a pair, uh, Benisa and uh, Benisa Zentea and her mother, Dr. Zentea. Benisa is a folklorist and musicologist, and Dr. Zentea is an anthropologist. And I'll play you this song. Uh, and we're really winging it here, so let me just find the actual location that I'm looking for. Uh, but I'll tell you about the song while I'm pulling this up. Uh, now, they found this book called the Alhaba, which uh, actually has a collection of songs, no sheet music, just lyrics, right? That, sorry, I'm just trying to get this situated here. Uh, the lyrics are in Spanish, and they were used to go effectively door to door to all these different groups to try to share um, this notion of, of Christianity, of, of this God that would save them. And uh, I think it's important to note that one of the reasons they might have needed saving is that there were increasing incursions into the territory. Now this is when the Spanish had first arrived, and as it initially sometimes gets presented, it's as though just a couple of missionaries stumbled onto this river and set up this location. And, and really, they did bring soldiers, they did bring people who were meant to settle it and create taxpayers. Uh, create a new, bigger tax base for the crown of Spain. And later on you hear stories about um, the, the indigenous population being recaptured after they go out and leave the property, being bound, mm -hmm. right? But also, as part of that process, they were leaving temporarily just to go practice their own ceremonies. They, they would join and live within the walls once they were built, but they also weren't allowed to practice absolutely everything that they, they had in the past. Some of it was a little a little too crazy for the missionaries, although some of it was interestingly allowed more than in a lot of other missionary locations around the world. So let's see, let me bring up this song here. And do we have audio? Oh, that's my phone. Volumes all the way up. Volumes all the way up. So that's just a little sample there, but it's, it's a really haunting melody. And so Benisa found melodic structures that seemed to match the, the actual lyrical song structure from the same period and, and recreated this song anew. And, and it's, it's really fascinating to see this process that they're going through to, to preserve this really interesting, very location specific, very time specific form of music and, and form of, of culture that was, in a sense, a part of the culture of my indigenous ancestors, but also was a, a tool used to, to change their culture. And, and there are a lot of really interesting perspectives on what that means and how that was done that I'm trying to continue exploring. Uh, I think that um, the, the amount of nuance that you're talking about that sometimes can be like skipped over when we're you know, um, trying to present a linear story 
Um, so I, I think that what I'm really understanding is that you're both like delving into these more experimental modes of practice um, to try and um, let come to the surface all of these these stories that there isn't you know a traditional home for um, or that you know haven't been kind of like woven into the fabric of this mainstream um, history and I love what you said Robert about um, like leaning into your own authorship um, on the one hand and then also like creating space for imagined histories you know making sure that um, perspectives that even if they're they're not um, validated by evidence or they're based on memory alone still um, are legitimate and have a, a place in this conversation um, and I think that that's just really important and I'm kind of wondering now it's making me really think about the editing process so I'm curious for both of you because um, I think we're, we're probably about to go over time soon. And I'm so happy about that. I'm so happy that we didn't actually get to some of my questions because it's so interesting just, just hearing you um, both talk about your projects and, and Katja too. So um, I would just love to hear a little bit more about how you decide because you're both in this process of collecting material and probably collecting more than you could ever imagine putting in these projects, at least in their current state. So how are you, dis how does that work and how is that different from um, you know, previous editing projects in more traditional formats? Well, we are um, definitely you know, trying to make sure that we include um, uh, media from all different disciplines and formats, you know, including you know, photography and archival footage and music. And, and there's one song in particular, I'm not sure it's going to be in the VR, but I think it'll be in the film. Katya, do you want to talk about the, the eagle, um, the, the song, the eagle that has, uh, eagle has landed? No. Um, if you could talk a little bit about um, the, the song, that archival song that we'd like to sort of interpret and sort of make as a theme for, for our project. Katja, can you hear us? Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's called The Eagle and, uh, and the Eagle and Me by Yip Harburg, and, and the version that we would love to use for the documentary is sung by Lena Horn. And, Lena Horn has performed in the Hampton House, which is one of the most uh, important cultural institutions, was one, and is hopefully becoming one again in Liberty, in Liberty uh, City. But uh, for the VR, um, we, 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 we discovered something uh, even more exciting, because Miami has such an incredible uh, music culture and but when, I think when people think about Miami, they think about the Miami Sound Machine and Gloria Estefan and all the salsa and, the, and you know and and there was the, like the first black record label in Florida was in Miami and it was called Johnny's Records and they um, Johnny's Records Shop and they um, they were trying to rival Motown and they are now people connoisseurs of that. 60s sound that's saying actually you know that music was as good if not even better than Motown it was just rougher it was a mix of church and street and marching bands and then of course the Caribbean which was very you know unique to Miami so we're trying to um, we're trying to include you know we're really trying to make this journey that people will take from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s and then 80s also a very musical uh, uh, journey. So that, to, to answer Anne's question, and, and uh, yeah, to answer your Anne's question. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> that's great. Okay. How about you, Robert? Yeah, well, um, if you could bring my screen up, I could show a couple of examples of how I'm, I'm thinking around this, but uh, I thankfully have uh, some really great opportunities that are possible with, with how I'm choosing to gather this material. Some of these oral history interviews I'm conducting are hours long, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I, I don't want to be the only person holding on to this material, and I don't want to have it be isolated and kept from others being able to learn from and experience, and, or just, just hear about people's experiences living within these missions or otherwise somehow connected to all these really important cultural moments. Now, I, I actually did have an initial conversation with a representative of UTSA, University of Texas at San Antonio, about possibly creating my own archive there, which is incredibly exciting, because then not only do I have a repository 
where I could put all this material for others to access, I can then open it up to others to contribute as well. And even before, or even if that doesn't happen, I'm going to start working on ways to build out the collaborative possibilities here so others can then submit material. Uh, but then in terms of actually selecting how I present it to the public, I've been thinking about this for a while now as a series of concentric circles. So I try to start at the center of, of a story. And, and I started, again, doing this for myself and my family. So it took a while for me to get there, but I'm trying to be OK with the notion of, of including myself in this. And just starting from there and then building outwards to include all these other different story elements. And again, it's, it's fragments. It's fragments, and they're starting to come further and further into the center of my story. It's, it's a spiral of sorts. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a really beautiful okay. process. So, I, I, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'll show you here one example of, of one type of material I'm gathering, where it's sort of almost a vernacular um, type of media or like aerial shots of the missions. We don't have enough of this showing all these different, literally different physical perspectives of these incredible structures. This is the old convento and these arches here at Mission San Jose, right? So I have a lot of this type of material. And I'm also creating vernacular images from the ground that'll allow people who aren't actually there to use the augmented reality application to see a panoramic view and feel as though they were there and to then navigate around the mission using these panoramic views and pull out these same augmented reality story elements that others who are there will be able to do. But then in a more poetic and interpretive sense, I want to find ways that people are taking uh, all these elements of culture and recreating something new. So this is a group called Ballet Napatla. And this is a performance I, I saw in San Antonio. They also just performed here last night in New York City. I, I caught that performance as well. And they're doing a ballet performance about Aralitas, or soldaderas, the Mexican soldiers of the, of the revolution. And uh, it's, it's you know, very much interpretive, but it still is a really important way to look at how we view history today. Mm -hmm. So um, in that sense, it's thinking, OK, um, where, where do all these intersect, and how do they connect? And how do I trace that route for others to begin their own exploration of this history? Yeah, and you're both using um, these like the architecture of the place and um, these stories in a lot of ways like really kind of subvert the um, the stereotypes about these places or the, the narratives that have like risen to the surface um, and you know in this sort of like whitewashing of history so I'm, I'm curious about how um, others in these spaces that are you know in, in your case working, um, within the mission as tour guides or, you know, the parks and in your case, um, you know, people that are coming in to redevelop and like, how are these projects being received um, for the audiences that might not be um, directly contributing to your narrative? Well, so far, you know, people have been you know, very supportive, but um, we, for the documentary, I have to say, it's um, a social issue documentary, um, and it's and also a journalistic documentary. So we're unearthing some stories, especially around climate gentrification. There's some really hard truths. Um, and so in, in many ways, we have to be quite careful um, about, because we're still mid-production, uh, about the stories that we cover and how public we make this. So even, you know, when Kachi and I were discussing, you know, do we do events before the film is completed? And, you know, because, you know, we don't want to tip our hand right. too much. Um, and, um, and, you know, we're, we're still, you know, case by case, uh, situation and we knew that this was you know really sort of an, an arts um, an arts uh, audience would be interested but we do have to be very discreet and I don't know Katya do you, do you want to talk a little bit about um, having to be um, uh, somewhat diplomatic in um, because we are still in production and it is you know there's some very sensitive political and social issues that we're addressing within within our projects I think, oh yeah, yeah, we may have, ah. Uh, uh, okay. So, but those but are wait, yeah, yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense, and that's something, I mean, we have to think about all the time at Magna Foundation, too, with um, our grantees and fellows who are producing stories that, you know, it can be quite dangerous to um, to share too much while, while it's in process. Right, so. stuff here, yeah. which is, um, 
uh, as uh, if you look at it by itself, it's it, it's historical and not political, you know, for many people. So people are it's, it's in a way much easier to talk about that and to ask for support also from the you know even from the city for that project for the VR project. Yeah, I mean that's a funding is a whole other. <laughs> A whole other workshop. Whole other workshop. <laughs> and um, Robert, I just wanted to also give you the opportunity to respond to that, and you know, the collab, like people that are um, are at the mission. Um, how how is that? There's so many different interests represented, and I alluded to this earlier. But even amongst the indigenous peoples who are there now, there are at least sort of I would say three separate divisions of people pursuing their own reclamation of identity, and. And they don't always agree with each other on how this should be done. And, and that's really where I see, like, I'm hoping that I can have some opportunity to be a little bit of a peacemaker and at least get them in dialogue with each other. I mean, I'm, that's certainly not something I'm going to do all on my own, but, but I'm in conversation with people about trying to make uh, some collaboration happen. It's difficult. It's very difficult. And then there are also other interests at all these missions. There's a parks department. There's UNESCO. There's the state of Texas. There's the Catholic Church, because there are still active parishes at, at most of these missions. And, and uh, the Alamo is its own separate entity. There's a nonprofit that only runs the Alamo. I, I should have mentioned before, but uh, the Alamo used to be Mission Valero. It's one of the five missions. And, and so that's a lot to navigate, and it's very complex. And in, in a sense, it, in a good way, it slows me down in that I need to really directly engage with people. I'm spending a lot more time doing sort of pre-production work, having conversations with people and trying to figure out what their framework is, and then having a separate meeting to record them and, and to, to document what they're, they're saying because I need to flesh out what's even going on in the first place. Yeah, great. Um, are we at time? I think we might be. Um, thank you so very much. This was, I just feel so proud to be able to sit at the table with you both, and um, this has been such a pleasure. And I, I hope for all of the, the VR babies and all of the techies <laughs> that are watching um, that this was also generative and I hope that you feel free to reach out to both Robert and Anne and Katja too um, for if you have any tricks of the trade, advice, comments, questions. Um, you know, I hope that this is a, an invitation to continue this conversation while you um, are in, in the midst of production. So um, if you have any last words too, I don't need to be the last one holding the mic. Uh, well, I'll actually let somebody else get the last word. We, we didn't get to all this ephemera here, but I'll, I'll find another way to share with you all another time. But here's a book from a really incredible project that I found at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And it's by Wafa Bilal. And if you look at the book, it is completely blank. And they allow visitors to take one copy if they exchanged another copy for this, or I'm sorry, another book that they wanted you to purchase. From, from the museum. And the reason they wanted you to purchase books and put them on the shelf and take one of these is because, um, well, I'll just read the, the comment here. It says, during the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the College of Fine Arts at the University of Baghdad lost their entire library from looters who set fire to the collection. More than 70,000 books were reduced to ashes. Over 13 years later, students still had few remnants from which to study. And this is, to me, such an incredible indicator of how important it is to preserve all these stories, to preserve these histories, and to share them so they're not all in one place, so that they're within all of us, and that we can keep them going for many generations to come. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.